Pam Hatton, President of Treasure Beekeepers, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, we're a bit, a bit taken aback by the popularity of these courses, but the room is full to capacity. We obviously we need the spaces. Yeah, there's also some come, chairs yeah. down the back as well. We need the spaces. If we have to evacuate the building, the two exits there onto the fields, or the way you came in. The toilets are also, you will have passed them on the way in, and there's a little passage on the left with toilets down there as well. Tea and coffee, trade stand, bib of books, courtesy of Carl. We've also got some guests, three seasonal bee inspectors, Julia Hoggard, I know Julia's here somewhere. Yeah, she's incognito. Uh, Jonathan Garrett and uh, Karen Smith. We've got Alex Ellis from the Bee Farmers Association Magazine Editor and BBKA Trustee, Diane Drinkwater, so welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you all. It's great to see you all. As I say, we've been a bit overwhelmed by the success of this event and others like it around the country. It just shows the interest there is in rearing home produced one here good quality foods. And it's by doing that that you'll improve over time the quality of your bees and the bees in your area. Now, a lot of you know Roger Patterson, he's been to Cheshire before, he's a very popular speaker, very practical beekeeper. Uh, something else I should have mentioned as well, for those that weren't there, there's a hearing loop at the front. Anybody with a hearing aid, you can switch into your teeth, teeth setting on your hearing aid if you're within the loop, okay? Roger's a very practical, person, practical beekeeper, full of good advice, I'm sure we'll have a super day. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Patterson. <laughs> Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yeah. You're all okay? Um, I don't know if you're aware or not, but uh, seven years ago there was some research done and um, uh, they were looking into groups like this about this sort of size and what they found was the more intelligent people tended to sit towards the front. <laughs> <laughs> right, they can all hear me out. <laughs> okay, that's the sort of day we're going to have folks. Um, uh, sustainability, um, bees uh, and queens for everyone using low cost, simple methods. The sort of thing that all you folk really ought to be able to uh, take, take up with. Um, I should be mentioning Dave Cushman's website several times during the day. I assume everyone knows of um, uh, the Dave Cushman website. It's reckoned to be the world's most uh, um, uh, comprehensive um, beekeeping website. Uh, Dave died in 2011 and he left it to me in his world and I'll really carry it on in the, exactly the same way that Dave originally uh, intended. I think actually if you can knock the other one out, um, yeah, is that easy for everyone to see? Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it sharp enough? Uh, okay. Um, exits. Um, turn mobiles off, please. Um, and please don't photograph in the screen because people do get fed up with people in front of them um, holding their hands up like this all day. But there's no need to worry because there's a video going to be made, if not of this uh, session, one of the others, and. Um, uh, it should well then be online. Um, please keep to time. Uh, we'll, it's, it's a difficult sort of day um, because um, uh, I've got to try and um, try and cram everything in. Um, so please keep to time. There will be a five minute warning. In fact, there'll be two five minute warnings. <laughs> now that's not no, no, no. Um, most of you uh, have, have met Nell, she's probably the best known dog in beekeeping. Um, and in fact, somebody was kind enough to bring her a bag of biscuits. What do you reckon on that? 
Um, but uh, on, if, if you don't like golf, just push her away or ignore her and she go and have a chat with somebody else. But at lunchtime or break times, that sort of thing, on Nell's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A um, little bit about Biver. It was founded just over 50 years ago in 1964. And the aims have always, within a word or two, been the same. For the conservation, restoration, study, selection and improvement of the native and near-native honeybees of Britain and Ireland. Um, this event is, um, is the second. I did the first one in Kent last, um, uh, last Sunday uh, to a full house uh, just like this. Um, and they'll be finishing towards the end of March. Um, and uh, there's nine of them originally. And as of a couple of days ago, um, we've got over 1,100 bookings today, and they're still coming in at a fair old rate. And uh, they're so popular, as Pam mentioned, that I think three weeks ago, um, the last one was set up. And within two weeks, we had 59 bookings. Um, we need hosts. Um, either individuals or beekeeping associations. And this one, I'm pleased to say, is hosted by the Cheshire Beekeepers Association, so thank you all very much for that. Um, mention uh, Carl Collier uh, on the right, Mo known to most of you po people uh, locally. Um, he's got some bits and pieces here from uh, Biver. If you want to chat with him about, um, about Biver, then uh, please do so. Um, also, Stuart Hatton's got um, several bits of homemade kit over here he's trying to sell. <laughs> so lunchtime, lunch times, if you need anything, just speak to um, uh, Carl. Um, there was another lady by the name of Anne Summers booked a table, but we couldn't <laughs> find um, Apparently they couldn't find one big enough for us, so, uh, uh, so she won't be turning up. A little bit about the day is really just to encourage beekeepers and beekeeping associations um, to produce their own bees and queens uh, rather than uh, buying. What is that then? Well, it's in the title. Sustainability. Uh, bees and queens are everyone using low cost, simple methods. Try and avoid buying and <coughs> most of all uh, without using imports. Now, I guess you're probably aware that the BBKA uh, policy is, um, uh, is to discourage uh, using uh, imports. And that's really what it's all about. What we're going to cover during the day was well, going to be some sort of background information to, um, uh, to sort of tell you where we're coming from and where we're going to. Hopefully to try and encourage uh, an increase in knowledge. Uh, a little bit about uh, various types of bees and their characteristics. And some practical suggestions for both beekeepers and beekeeping uh, associations which will be towards the end of the day. This is not a queen bearing uh, or bee breeding uh, event. Yes, we'll touch on it, but the, the problem is I just haven't got time uh, for detail, and this really isn't the sort of um, uh, event that we can do that. It really needs sort of hands-on. Uh, what I will be suggesting is some techniques that you could probably use, and I must assume that um, the beekeepers that are here know the basics, the simple sort of stuff that we all need to know as a beekeeper. Any techniques can be taught at, um, uh, uh, in smaller groups um, much better because you get hands on and if somebody's got a little bit of a problem, uh, you can, uh, we, well, we can help them out. Biller can do that uh, if you like, or um, I know there's some really good um, uh, queen rearers uh, locally, just arrange your own stuff um, uh, locally. If you want to know anything about Biller, um, uh events, uh, speak to uh, Carl or myself. Uh, at the brace. So what are we doing? We're really propagating both bees and queens and in my view the two have got to go together because if you're trying to make up a new dish you still need a queen for it somehow so they've really got to go together. And in doing so um, we've got an opportunity to improve our bees. But you need to understand what's happening uh, hence the background information or, 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 or most of it. Now, I've got to be absolutely honest, because I'm that sort of chap. Um, some of what you see today, if you've seen any of my other presentations, you may well see a little bit of overlap. Um, sorry, but that's inevitable when you do. I think I've got about 38 titles now, and you know, I've taken a bit out of 
uh, several of them to put this presentation uh, together. Some of what I'll be telling you uh, won't be found in books. So those of you who are perhaps going down the exam route, uh, you may well have a little bit of a problem that the, um, uh, uh, the examiners uh, won't, um, may not accept what I'm telling you. But um, uh, I think it works, it works for me. Um, and if you just give the source that you learnt it from me, you're absolutely guaranteed to fail. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be giving a few examples uh, during the day. Um, uh, I will be doing it to actually make a point, not necessarily to criticise anyone, um, but I'll try my best uh, not to identify anyone or a beekeeping uh, association. But how else, when you're teaching, how else do you get information out to uh, beekeepers without showing examples? There's a lot of my opinion here. Um, not necessarily people. So if, if I say something, don't go charged off and say, oh, people policies this, people policies that. No, it's not. It, it's, um, it, it's coming straight from me. But I'm going to be aiming at all beekeepers. I'm going to try and satisfy everybody. And I know there's a wide range of knowledge here. I know there's some people have been keeping bees as long as me or perhaps a little bit um, uh, longer. So who's out there? Anybody with no bees yet? About, what, ten or a dozen? Less than five years beekeeping. These figures, strangely, are different than Kent last week, Carl. Yeah. Already. Okay. Between five and ten years. <coughs> That's more than those less than five years. That's surprising. Kent, I think, was the other way around, Carl, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, over ten years. You must be fairly rich. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got five colonies or less? Between six and twenty? Mm, about the same, I think. Mm. Twenty-one to fifty? Over fifty? Right, two, three. So, presumably we've got sort of beef farmers here as well. How many of you are currently teachers, demonstrators, or speakers um, to beekeepers, I mean? Probably percentage, same as Kent, I think, Carl. No, put your hand down, Carl. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do it. Yeah. <laughs> Who's a, uh, a beekeeping association official or committee or whatever? Okay, well, I should be addressing some things to you. Hopefully you can... Um, uh, you take on board what you say and take it back to your association. How many of your apiary managers? Right, actually so am I, so I'm on, I'm on your side. In my view, they are um, quite an important part of the people in association because they're managing probably the main um, teaching resource uh, that there is in the association. So please, please, please support them, please help them out. Don't, uh, don't just come along to a meeting 20 minutes late, go home 20 minutes early and then moan or care about what, uh, what, what, what's happened there. Please, please, please help them, please support them, please try to understand that they are all volunteers and they are really trying to help you. And I'm actually quite serious on that one. Um, what I'm also serious about is in, to the best of my knowledge, in 1622, uh, the first bee importations were made to the United States. In 1640, um, only 18 uh, years later, the town of Newbury, Massachusetts, um, did something which I think had a lot of forethought, um, for, uh, foresight in, in it. Um, they set up a municipal uh, community uh, uh, apiary, and I quote, a combination educational experimental station and welfare program. They actually put a man in charge by the name of John Eales. He happened to turn out to be the town's first pauper. <laughs> <laughs> so look after your apron managers. Um, bit about my beekeeping. Um, I started in 1963 in West Sussex. So I come from West Sussex, so you can tell already that English is my second language. <laughs> At one stage, for about 15 years or so, I had 130 colonies, as well as running a full-time job and all the rest of it. I've always produced bees, queens, and honey. 
always. I'm currently the apron manager where I have been for the last 15 years or so at my local association and a demonstrator, which I've been for 40 odd years, at my local association, Whisper Green uh, Beekeepers Association. As Pam mentioned, I'm a practical beekeeper. Born and brought up on a farm, been an engineer all my working life. So I can use my hands uh, and a little bit of what's between there and there. So I understand your needs. Well, I've probably been through it all myself. And I'm speaking to you from experience, what, some, uh, what I've learned, not out of books. Uh, I've used an awful lot of methods, as those of you who have been keeping bees some time probably have as well. I've used and handled a lot of different kinds of bees in a lot of different kinds of hives. And because I get around the country quite a bit, um, I'm in the privileged position of, uh, of actually doing that. And a lot of people will probably give you um, uh, advice about, oh, this is the best time, this is the best bee, or whatever. And I do wonder sometimes if they've actually done it rather than just uh, following what somebody else has said. I travel widely um, in the UK and Ireland, where I've had an awful lot of colleagues, spoken to a lot of beekeepers just like you folk. I've been chatting to people this morning. <coughs> seen a lot of beekeeping associations, and seen a lot of teaching facilities as well. But I've always listened. Even if somebody appears to be talking a load of twaddle, very often they can come up with something and you think to yourself, hang on a minute, why on earth haven't I thought of that before? So don't dismiss what other people tell you. So in my opinion, you really can't judge a beekeeper. This is based on what I've seen uh, around. Uh, by the length of time they've been keep keeping bees, because there are an awful lot of people with only one or two years experience that are, quite frankly, streets ahead, those who may well have been keeping bees 20 years. What you what you really got to do is try, to, um, uh, try and assess the situation. You can't um, tell by the number of colonies they got either, because sometimes somebody with two or three colonies is a much better practical um, a caring beekeeper than somebody who's probably, probably got a hungry. And I'm afraid you can't necessarily go on qualifications either. Okay, they're probably a little bit of a guide, but there are some um, very good people who've got all the qualifications, and there are also some that are, that are, are less so. So sustainable beekeeping of that import, then, is it, is it possible? Well, since the closing of the Channel Land Bridge, um, about 10,000 years ago, uh, they were, bees were, um, uh, uh, they, they survived no problem at all with that import. Um, I've had dealings with Orkney, Oliver Man and, and Collinsy, and they both had closed populations for um, in excess of 25 years. I think the Oliver Man has had a closed population since at least 1987. Um, sm quite small numbers, I think there are 80 on colonies on Orkney, uh, 50 on Collinsy, and there's uh, probably about 800 on the Oliver Man. So, yes, there's absolutely no argument um, can they um, uh, can we survive with their imports? We may well have to in the future because if the if the government do ban uh, imports, once um, this whatever it is is is, is going to affect us, where we where we, we we seek the rest of them. Um, so what are we talking about? What's uh, what's the issue then? Um, here's the figures from the NBU website from 2011 to last year. Um, in 2011, there were um, 4,568 queens booked in, not necessarily came in, but booked in uh, from the EU. Last year, it gone up fourfold. So that's really what we're up against. In 2018, how many queens were imported from Argentina? Anybody any idea? All right, I'll tell you then, 525. Exactly the same figure as 2017, the year before. They had Nozema and Varroa, so we have uh, as well. How many of you know that there are Africanized bees in Argentina? That's not a disease issue at all. Well, we could end up with aggression 
through um, through genetic material being brought in. I'm not saying we're going to, and I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but I think there ought to be a lot of caution. So, what are the objections to import then? Three mainly from most beekeepers, possibly less suited to our conditions, possibly introdu introduction of pest diseases, pathogens that we haven't yet got, and there are things lining up to get at us, as you know, at, no, uh, no. and possibly aggressive uh, aggression in uh, later generations, and that can be a, a, a big problem, which I would uh, discuss uh, later. I put possibly because they may not, uh, and I'm, I certainly don't want to accuse uh, anybody of anything, but I think being an island, we've got plenty of bees here, we can improve what we've got, um, and we can, we can do it without the threat of uh, possible problems. Now, DEFRA have recently run a queen replacement survey. Uh, the figures were given out, I think, last August. They asked 26 questions. Did anybody get involved with it? One, two, half a dozen or so. Okay. They had 5,763 responses, which um, I think was, it appears quite a big sample, doesn't it? But, personally, I think it's unreliable, or the results are unreliable, because for two, two responses, there were just over 200 answered the question, Four and a half thousand skipped the question, so I really don't think we can take too much notice of that. <coughs> Everybody still awake? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> they did, however, raise some good points, which I'm going to um, uh, bring up uh, in a minute, and we'll cover some today. And I've selected some questions. Now, what I've done is uh, I've rounded the percentages up or down to the nearest half a percent. So make it easy for you to read. One of the questions. Why did you purchase queens instead of rearing them yourself? I do not have the experience to raise my own queens at 41%. Less, just less than half. I think I'm going to be telling you later on that that figure uh, is in incredibly high. I do not have the time needed to raise queens 17%. Again, um, I don't think that's... Um, that's uh, necessarily great. To improve the temperament of the colony, which may well be 35%, but on the other hand, using imports could well be making the situation worse in the first place. So perhaps if we don't use imports, we may not get the, the uh, temper problem. To improve the productivity of the colony, 23%. Question 15. What form of assistance will help you to increase the number of queens you rear in future? Mentoring. Um, now, I don't know what they actually mean, but uh, mentoring to me is sort of one-to-one. -one. I don't know what it means to you, but I do come from uh, Sussex. <laughs> Training courses, 47%. So people seem to want some sort of um, uh, teaching. Would you be interested in attending the course that will help you improve your queen rearing skills? Yes, 60%. So which 40% which of you lot don't want to know? <laughs> no, 22%. <coughs> Are you part of a queen breeding improvement uh, program? No, 95%. That to me is pretty high. But most of us come from a beekeeping association and uh, later on in the day, I'll be suggesting that perhaps beekeeping associations could do something about this to rapidly drop that figure. Do you think the mixing of native and imported honeybee strains is positive? Only 12%. Now that surprised me a little bit. I would have thought probably it would be nearer 50. Negative 46%. So nearly half the beekeepers recognise as a problem with imported uh, strains. Surprisingly, even more surprisingly, um, the don't knows and the unsure are 42 percent. Um, and I don't know why, perhaps it's probably new beekeepers that were asked and they haven't got a clue. I don't know. Would you be in favour of a national breeding programme for England based on the near native, near-native subspecies Apis mellifera? 
There's a little bit of contradiction there, but let's not worry about that. Yes, 79%, no, 8%. Um, no disrespect to the vast majority of beekeepers, but I, surprise, I, I, will, um, uh, I would suspect the vast majority of them hadn't actually handled or had any experience. So I think the 79% is probably high. Um, there may well be reasons for that, um, and it may just be that um, uh, the question wasn't perhaps asked in the right way. However, I think they're all good points. Beekeeping, I believe, needs to address them, otherwise there's not much point having the survey in the first place. What that tells me is beekeepers actually want to learn. Um, but how can we do it? I'm suggesting we're all involved, where either individuals or some of us are involved in national and local beekeeping associations. So I think that perhaps together we could do something about this, which is obviously um, a, a problem. So let's go for it. Just a few thoughts. In getting around, I have to say that in my opinion, overall beekeeping standards and the advice that beekeepers are sometimes given is very often quite poor. I have to say some is very, very good, but I think overall the standards are quite low. Um, I get around uh, and I, I see people perhaps be, being keeping bees 10, 15, 20 years, don't know the life cycle of anything. That to me is appalling. How many of you folk don't know the life cycle of anything? Put your hand out, cop. <laughs> In the last three or four years, I've come across a beekeeper. He's got a dozen colonies. He, um, he's a farmer, he's a sheep farmer. Um, and he supplies three shots of honey. And he's been, he took over from his father, who took over from his grandfather. So beekeeping in the family. I showed him the first queen he'd ever seen and recognised in his colonies. And he handles his bees on a regular basis. So that's, that's one thing. Um, how many of you folk know of Gormanston, the summer school in Ireland? Yeah, several. If you get the chance of going to Gormanston, I suggest very strongly you do it. You can fly locally from, I suspect, Manchester, Blackpool and um, Liverpool. Uh, and Liverpool. You can, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, you get out of Dublin. It's a, it's a whole week course with different levels. Um, so it, it, it suits the beginner beekeeper or it, the more experienced one. Anyway, I gave a talk out there a couple of three years ago and uh, at lunchtime a man sat down beside me and um, uh, I started chatting away and he said to me that he actually nailed down his queen excluders to the top of the uh, brood box. So, I was a bit intrigued by this, so I had to ask him why he did it. So he said, uh, oh, it's got the uh, queen excluder coming up with the supers. So I said, well, how do you, how do you get down in the brood chamber? Oh, he said, I don't bother with that. He said, no, need to. <laughs> well, he said, I'll get enough honey. <laughs> you know, he hadn't got a clue what was going on inside his, 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 um, his own hives. But the best one, um, was just a few weeks ago, somebody told me there's a bit beginner's course I don't know where it is. The other two I know about, this one I don't, but it came from a very reliable source. There's a beginner's course um, that the local association is charging £75 for, and apparently the tutor started beekeeping last year. Now, unless you're reading off somebody else's notes, um, uh, surely you need somebody who's much more experienced than that. But this, I'm afraid, folks, is the sort of stuff that I do occasionally see when I go around. We aren't alone. I've been to the States a couple of times fairly recently and uh, some of the stories that I can tell you about them are very, very similar. I think we've got to get above that sort of level. So a few more thoughts. Personally, I think we need a culture change in, uh, in, in our beekeeping in this country. I believe that beginners are incredibly important. So many beekeeping associations which have just put out uh, um, uh, anybody almost to try and teach them. It's at that stage that they really need the good sound information, not just somebody who's been keeping bees for a year or two uh, telling them what they've done. Having done that, so are the rest. And there's so many beekeeping associations that abandon 
uh, beekeepers after their first year, and I think that's a, that's a crying shame. Beekeepers need to have abilities, in my opinion, and um, op pairs of observations so you can actually see what's happening in the colony, so you can spot if something's going right or wrong. You very definitely need lateral thinking. You're at a colony here today, what's going to happen tomorrow? Next week, the week after next. Um, you really need to be able to sort out what, what, what's going to happen. And of course, common sense. Uh, I don't know about your area, but in my area, it's very common these days. I always encourage beekeepers to challenge what they're told. Even what I tell you, challenge it. You can probably do it best if you've got a little bit of knowledge in the first place, but if somebody tells you something, try and work out if it's likely to be right or not. Very often you'll find it may not be. I also encourage people to do simple experiments too, um, because sometimes the things that you're told, you can, once they disprove them, but you can certainly uh, find out that there are other answers as well. And one of the things that I do encourage people to do is if you take a queen away from a colony, inspect it every day for three weeks at roughly the same time, and it's surprising how much you'll learn. One of which is the age of larva. So let's say you've um, had a, uh, a colony with a queen that's been taken away five days, have a look at the smallest larva, that's what a five day old larva looks like. And with phones, or uh, 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 mobile uh, uh, telephones, um, being able to take photographs now, it's so easy to take photographs. Even if you cut the uh, cut the cell walls down to the base, you can, you can take a, a, a photograph. Another thought, we've got an awful lot of politics in British beekeeping, it's almost everywhere. Let's try and cut that out and think about the bees. Little insects, 15 millimetres long. That's what really matters. So if you've got any uh, politics in your local as association, the sort of people who want to stop people doing things or, 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 or whatever, kick them out. Sorry, folks, but kick them out. So I favour educating people, giving them the right information, and then demonstrating it, which you can do perhaps in a teaching apron, and then you can persuade people, perhaps, to change their mind. Um, and I think they're far more powerful tools than force. You must do this, you must do that. You must do something else, otherwise you're a bad beekeeper. But you need to do it from a position of experience and uh, knowledge. How are we going to do this then? Well, beekeepers learn in different ways. Each one of you has learned uh, learned in different ways. You've all got different interests in beekeeping. You want to know different things and that sort of thing. We, as um, uh, teachers, we got to work with you folk. Not just pow, 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 pow. That's what you've got. Um, write it down, tick the boxes that you've learned it, and off you go. Just give people um, information and try and work with them. So, you know, some people are going to be uh, easy uh, at picking things up. Others perhaps not so easy, but they'll pick something else up quickly. Work with them and get to know them as well. So beekeepers, I think, need to get good sound information, uh, beekeeping associations rather, need to get good sound information out to, uh, to their uh, members. Whoops, 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 whoops. How can they do it? Well, websites is a pretty useful way of uh, doing things. Uh, so if you've got a decent webmaster, you can actually set up quite a good uh, website, it's, um, it's informative. And in a lot of um, uh, websites, have a rummage around. Look at things like old newsletters, and sometimes you, you can see some absolute gems there. The sort of thing that somebody said at a meeting, it's not in print anywhere, somebody else has picked it up, or Albert or El Elsie or whatever, um, uh, said so and so, and you think to yourself, hang on, this is so simple, why isn't it part of mainstream uh, beekeeping? If you have lectures, courses, and demonstrations, make sure that the, the speakers and the demonstrators are actually good uh, people. Don't just take them because they've got a big name somewhere else, because that might not, not necessarily give you what you want. And I believe teaching priests are, uh, are very, very important. 
um, I better be careful because um, there may well be some here who haven't got them uh, for, uh, for whatever reason. So teaching beginners then, their views and habits are formed early. They generally tend to, um, uh, to retain what the first person uh, told them. It's then difficult to change later if perhaps there is an alternative or better way of doing things uh, or, or, or whatever. The uh, beginners' courses, they're told the usual sort of standard fares, taught how, uh, what piece to have, how to use a bee brush, port a piece of extracting equipment, diseases, all sorts of things like that. How many of them actually teach the production of queens, which is absolutely crucial to every colony, colony increase, colony assessment, stock improvement. Let's change that. So local beekeeping associations, this I think is where most uh, learning is done. It used to be done when we, when we all had county beekeeping instructors. Those posts have gone 20 years ago. Now it's down to beekeeping associations to do the vast majority of teaching. Some do an incredibly good job, they really do. Um, they've got things set up uh, nicely. Others uh, I've seen, and the demonstration just opens a, a hive, takes a frame out and hands it to everybody. That doesn't teach anybody anything apart from handling, handling a frame. An awful lot of them are teaching straight from books, which I don't think is necessarily the right way to teach people. You just don't get respect from the people um, you, you, you're teaching. And why not just give them a library book? <coughs> Very often the beginners teaching beginners, and I do come across associations where this year's beginners teach last year, uh, next year's beginners. Um, I'll just leave that one there in case there are any here who do the same. Many don't teach past the first year. At Whisper Green we had a, a couple of um, uh, ladies that they travel 50 miles to every meeting and they'd done the first year, they got to the um, end of the first year, and uh, they said, well, right, what's, what's going to happen for the second year? Oh, well, you're, you're on your own. What do you mean we're on, on, on our own? Oh, well, if you want to know anything, just go and read a book or, or have a look online. I'm sorry, folks, but that's, in my view, not the way to teach the, the, the future of beekeepers. So, you beekeeping associations, um, I'm going to be putting a little bit of pressure on you, because I hope the people who aren't on the committee will either come and help you or they'll, they'll, they'll push you to do things. But I'm involved as well, because I've been involved in my local association um, uh, committee for over 50 years now, and um, I also need, um, need to get pushed as well. So that's the bones. Now perhaps a little bit of uh, meat. I'm very, very definitely not here to tell you folk what to do. I don't tell anyone what to do. If I can give them some uh, suggestions, make ideas, if they want to use them, fine. If they don't, um, that's also fine. It's entirely up to them. Some of the things I tell you may well conflict with uh, convention because there are certain groups who just want to teach their way and that's it. They don't sort of accept that, um, that there are other ways of doing things. And I'm not the sort of chap to rubbish anybody else's ideas uh, or methods, unless they happen to be Ray Dowson's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay because he's not very good at hearing, you see. <laughs> uh, and I hope I don't undermine your teachers. So if I say something uh, that's different than your teacher, there may well be two ways of doing things. May well be. I don't know. What I do know is um, that in uh, beekeeping, there are lots of different ways of getting from here uh, to here. And I thought, I nicked this off the um, uh, internet and I thought it was brilliant, it sums up beekeeping. But at the end of the day, it's really got to fit your system, whatever you've got. Yes, you can go to a meeting and, um, and uh, ask a question and be told 138 different answers, if indeed there's 138 people there but they very, very rarely ask you either how you've got into a particular position or what your situation is. It may well be that you've only got, let's say, a single brew chamber and they, the, the, they tell you the, uh, a technique that needs a double brew chamber, all sorts of things like that. 
At the end of the day, we've all got a system. Every one of us, there's 250 people in here apparently, you've all got a system. Even those who put their hand up and uh, said they've got your bees yet. You've got a system because you've presumably done a little bit of reading and you, you've thought how you'll keep your bees when you do come to keep them. Um, but the rest of us, we, we change depending on situations. It might be what interests we've got, uh, the time we've got, the sort of bees we've got, the area we keep bees in, all sorts of things like that. Mine is based on simple management techniques. Simple, because if you keep things simple in beekeeping, you've generally got a, a, a get out of jail card. And I do hear lectures and um, read magazines. Sometimes what, um, what I'm told is so complicated that I struggle to understand it. How on earth is a beginner going to? I keep non-prolific bees. When I say non-prolific, the queens do not lay masses and masses of eggs. They lay they, 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 they small quantities. That allows me to keep my bees on single brew chambers, British standard frames, and standard frames, uh, nationals I use now, it used to be WBCs, cottage hives, all sorts of things like that, if any of you can remember them. Summer and winter. And how often do you hear that uh, you can't keep bees in a, uh, in a single brew chamber, it isn't big enough? Oh yes it is, if you've got the right, um, right bees and um, uh, your management techniques as well. I use castellated spaces in brew boxes. I repeat, I use castellated spaces in brew boxes. <laughs> I've had so much kicking for this um, by people who've actually never used them. Anyway, <laughs> queen rearing and bee improvement to me is a major part of my, um, my, my system. I'm doing it all the time, or I'm thinking about it all the time. And I've never worn a bee suit in my life, and I'm really proud of that. So how many folks of you do those things? Don't put your hands up, but I suspect probably few. <coughs> Why not? Suit me? Why shouldn't they suit you? They think my system will work well for me? Why, why, why shouldn't they work for you? It's because you might well have a different way of doing things. You found something that suits you uh, better? Fine, go ahead and do it. As long as you care for your bees, that's, that's all right with me. If you want to have bees that are made out of wheat or bees, I do not give them monkeys. If you look after your bees, fine. I have been heavily criticised for some of those too. Um, uh, not only the castellated spaces, but I was uh, criticised by, let's say, uh, a beekeeper who's fairly, fairly well up the, um, uh, up the ladder for not wearing a bee suit because I give the wrong impression to, to beginners. Well, I, I wear um, a, a veil and that's good enough for me. But I have the answer though. They give criticise me as much as they like. Here's my beekeeping. I've not used imported queens for well over 50 years, something like 52, 53 at least. All I've done is just selected from local stock. I call them their native because their the characteristics are very close to our native bees. And the system I just told you about has evolved. Uh, and it's evolved to suit my bees, my district, um, the, the sort of things um, that I'm interested in, in, in beekeeping. Yours will develop in exactly the same way, and evolve in the same way. Now my own bees, in the last uh, three years, autumn, this, this is the um, uh, average amount of sugar that I've fed them. 2016 autumn, one kilo per colony. 2017, two kilos. 2018, um, just under uh, two kilos of colony. How many of you folk can actually say that? Now, I'm not, I'm not criticising you at all, I'm just telling you what I've managed to do by selecting my bees. Winter losses, 2016-7, and 25 colonies, which is what I've got, varies between about 22 and 28, um, I lost three colonies. They were all of them to queen problems, every one of them. Queen disappeared, uh, drone layer, or whatever. Following year, 2017-18, I only lost one, and that again was a queen problem. 
And this went to so far, I've lost one colony, which is starvation, which I'll tell you about a little bit later on. The last two years, 2017, 2018, in the spring, uh, I've not fed at all, although I will admit to moving a few cones from those that can afford it to those that are a little bit short. Having done that, I marked down those that were short, and if there's a good reason for them being short, fine. If there isn't, they've used up too much, they're marked down for reclaiming. Last two years, I've averaged just over £100 of honey per colony in an area that I would describe as Midland. It's not the greatest area at all. So I reckon that's pretty good. Um, I think that's successful beekeeping and, su and sustainable too. What on earth do I need imports for? What do I need them for? <coughs> Two of our members, and we've got well, it's a bit difficult at the moment, but we normally have about 150, 160 members uh, during the summer. Two of them. Uh, I'll call him John, because that's his name. Um, last year, he, he's only got one colony. He took £162 of honey off it, and he left one super of honey, so no feeding. <clears throat> now, Susie's rather an interesting lady. She's a granny with, I think, 11 grandchildren, some more on the way. Um, 2017, she took £675 um, of honey off seven colonies, so just under £100 a colony. 2018, um, when she thought that um, all the grandchildren, that uh, she wouldn't have time for a piece, she, she sold some of her bees off, only down to four colonies, she took £620 of honey uh, off those four. Now, I did ask her what, um, uh, what feeding she'd done, how much uh, sugar, and uh, all she told me was, was a volume. And if I try to work out what it was, I'll probably give them, give them the wrong uh, answer. So, yes, she did feed them, but I don't really know how much. All of these were on single brood chamber. All home rear queens, the local sort of stuff that we use. Um, so, you folk, I think, can do the same. Because I think you, you've got potentially um, uh, uh, some good, good, good forage up this way, or so I'm told. Now bees differ greatly. Um, the standard advice that gets uh, trotted out assumes they're all the same. And we know that even the, the, uh, the, the different subspecies, they all, they've all got different behaviour and different needs. You, you, sometimes you need different techniques uh, to manage them. Seems to be one size fits all mentality what I call beekeeping by numbers. You do this, you do that, you do something else. You get around and see different kinds of bees and you soon realise that what perhaps suits someone in Cornwall may not suit somebody in uh, Northumberland uh, or in Wales. We're dealing with biology and I wish beekeeping teachers would understand that. Beeke uh, biology in itself is very, very variable. So you often need different uh, management uh, techniques, simple things like perhaps some you, you can get away with a single brood chamber, others you need either a bigger box or, um, or, or double, multiple brood chambers. But the books and the screen uh, don't tell us that, do they? Do this, do that, do something else. Not why. The standard information then uh, from everybody is you must have large colonies, big, big, um, uh, uh, big colonies bringing lots of honey, you need prolific queens. Bees need X kilos of food for winter, and you've all heard that one, haven't you? If you leave queen cells, always leave two. I'll talk about that later on, but this is the sort of stuff that often gets trotted out. Local bees, whatever they are, chase you up the garden path, so you need something different. <coughs> Requeen regularly every year or two. Molly copper bees. Pack them up, feed them this, feed them with that, feed them with something else. Single brood chamber is uh, uh, too small. And the feed, feed, feed mentality. A lot of this stuff has come into beekeeping in the last 15 or 20 years. Never heard it beforehand. And, you know, similar sort of stuff. So why do these perpetuate then? Well, I'm afraid 
a lot of it, it comes from inexperienced people doing the teaching. Sorry, folks, um, uh, but uh, but that's that's how I see. Now, just because you're a teacher, I'm going to say you're an experience, and I'm not sort of really getting uh, at anyone. But see some of the stuff online; it's appalling, um, uh, appalling twaddle. It's just simply cut and pasted. Somebody comes up with something, somebody else thinks, "Cool, that sounds all right," and um, uh, they copy and paste it. All of a sudden, it's in two places. Get in about five places, and it becomes fact. But there's little alternative talk. So those that do know there is, it's not always like that, tend to think, oh, I'll just let them get on with it. I'm afraid, folks, we've got to um, jump in and say, look, sorry, but it isn't always like that, and it doesn't have to be. Let the bees tell us. Observe your bees, see what's happening to them. And the best teachers are beekeeping, they've got two legs and stand in front of an audience. They've got six legs and they've got four wings. We as beekeepers need to, need to look at them and see what they're telling us. So teaching apiary then, I've already hinted, I think, I think is that it, it's, a, it's a great asset. Um, uh, I, wouldn't, I was about to say absolute necessity, but it's, um, uh, they're, they're very important in my view. You can learn far more in front of a colony of bees with them telling you what they're doing than you can by reading any book or, um, uh, or, uh, or even going and standing talking about, as I said now, uh, to somebody standing talking to you. If they're well managed, um, they're an absolute uh, gem. Just give people good sound information, uh, have some good sound, useful equipment, not a load of junk and rubbish that, um, uh, that somebody's trying to sell you that, that, that isn't really uh, necessary. Um, I haven't heard it yet, but I think Pete Sutcliffe, who's in the audience, has got a, uh, a talk, uh, something like Kit You Don't Need or something like that. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear that, um, unless, of course, the rest of you put me off. <laughs> and get some experienced demonstrators, if you possibly can. You may well perhaps have to persuade a few people, because some people are actually quite shy. But some of the uh, older beekeepers, or people who have been keeping bees some time, um, they really uh, are quite good. They just need to be get that information teased out some way. So when, you, um, uh, when you're teaching, you can include things like colony assessment, uh, queen bearing, colony increase, and uh, of course you've got the option to provide bees and queens for your members. And we'll go through that a little bit later on with some ideas. Here is one teaching apiary I went to. Um, very good facilities, nice big area, a um, couple of nice uh, sheds, in fact I think there were three but I can't remember. Um, if there is a criticism, I don't think they've set their bees out too, uh, too well. Um, you sort of can't get around some of the colonies, which you need to do if you're teaching. But the great thing is, there's so much space there that although they didn't do it, they could have a little Queen Mary night tree and a little area for producing bees simply for other beekeepers. This one uh, I came across as an old, old wall garden, uh, I believe. I think there's a... Uh, uh, an old garden wall on the right hand side. Lovely little apiary run by a man who was, uh, who was over 80 and he had some brilliant bees in there in an area that I, I, I expected to have quite poor, see quite poor bees. But see he's got things set out, you can get round, get round the hives. There was plenty of room in that particular apiary which was well maintained for having um, other things such as queen rearing and uh, producing uh, bees. <coughs> This one was in the corner of a two acre field and uh, they couldn't get any more than six uh, beekeepers in there to teach them. I don't quite know why it's set up like that, um, but there's certainly no room for expansion in, in that one. It'd be nice if they uh, had it done, and I think the chairman was actually the owner of the field, so there, was, uh, and there are no animals in there, no sign of animals. So um, this is the sort of size apiary that I tend to see in urban areas uh, sometimes, which is, if that's the best they've got, then absolutely fine. But try and make the best use of uh, what area you've got. This is theirs at Whisper Green, 
um, in what I call sort of shading woodland. It's fairly light woodland. And I know there's a few that are bees, um, bees in wood. Um, you shouldn't have bees in woods. And in fact, there is a, an old saying, bees in the wood never did good. Well, is living proof that uh, um, the, that uh, isn't always correct because when I had 130 colonies, they were all kept in woodland. So it, it does work. Make sure you set the hives out so that everyone can get, get round them and you get yourself organised. And in our case, we make sure everybody who goes anywhere near the, the hives has certainly got head cover. So <coughs> we can teach and learn the uh, basics. Um, I'm really just going to do the ones that are relevant to today's topic. So that is the life cycles. The swarming process is necessary because when you're raising a queen cells or you've got queen cells, there is a chance if the colony is in the right condition, the first queen to emerge could go off with a swarm if everything is, is correct. So we need to know the swarming process. You also need to um, know the health of bees and uh, the brood as well. So you need healthy bees and brood. It's great if you can recognise disease, both EFB and AFB. Um, now they are a little bit difficult for um, the, what I call the ordinary beekeeper, and the reason is simple. The vast majority of beekeepers will never ever see foul brood, and that's the danger. Now EFB can on occasions look very much like chalk brood, AFB can look a little bit like sack brood. So don't just dismiss them as chalk, um, chalk brood or sack brood because you may well get it wrong. If, you've, if you have bee health days in your area, I suggest very, very strongly that you book on them because that, uh, um, overall I think the bee inspection service in this country is absolutely brilliant, but that to me is one of the, um, the highlights of what they do. So, I always suggest to people that when they inspect a colony, the first frame they take out um, uh, of a colony that's got brood in all stages, just lightly shake the people off. You don't have to get rid of all of them. Look at the sealed brood for signs of American foul brood, the unsealed brood for signs of EFB. If, if it's clear, you can assume the rest of the colony is clear. If there is a problem in any of the other cones, which there could well be, um, you'll pick it up sooner or later. At least you've got it in your mind um, that, um, that you're, you're, you're checking for disease. So check for every inspection, and it should be a habit. Just like picking up your high tool or lighting your smoke. Now, that we've got queen problems with, um, uh, with our queens, uh, so is everybody else, but let's not worry about that. Um, they've appeared about the turn of the 21st uh, century. That's when I first uh, noticed them. So let's just look at what should happen naturally um, with, uh, with queens. Perhaps live three to five years before being superseded. Perhaps they'll swarm, some might not swarm at all, others will swarm perhaps about three times in, in, in their lives. Supersedure should be at the end of the season. In my area, from probably the end of July right through to um, early September, I suspect here might be a week uh, earlier on both of those. Any failures used to be in the spring, so anybody who kept bees before about 2000 will probably recognise what I've been uh, talking about here. So what happens now? We've got several things, but three main ones. A young queen's being superseded soon after laying, sometimes. Young queens failing and queens simply disappearing. Let's just briefly look at them. Superseding, um, they can appear to be laying well, good brood, and then all of a sudden you get between one and three queen cells. That's the key. One and three queen cells. Any more is likely to be swarming. Problem is, colonies can swarm on them. Um, and um, uh, even if, um, if there's only one, uh, supersedure cell, they very often will, will swarm with an old queen who could well be in the first stages of failure and that's one of the reasons that we get so many swarms these days with failing queens or failed queens. 
Quit failing, could be drones in worker cells, and I mean drones in worker cells, not drones in drone cells, and you can tell them easily because they're usually on their own. Reduce laying, perhaps you'll have a look at a colony in June where everything should be roaring away, and when last inspection, the queen was laying right across the box, she may well be just laying on two, three, four combs in the middle with eggs all over the place. So is the regular brew pan. And then queens disappearing. Um, there's rarely a visual problem, in my experience, with the brood. So you can't tell that the problem is, is coming. And then all of a sudden you go to an inspection. Uh, no eggs. Queen gone. Now, they may or may not build emergency cells, but I think that's a little bit uh, of, a, of a key because I suspect the queen's gone off late instantly, stayed in the colony for several days, so the bees still think they've got a queen, and then, of course, it's too late to put up uh, emergency cells. Now, if you come across any of these folk, um, any of these folks, um, uh, don't start beating yourself up because it's unlikely to be your fault. I've been accused on many occasions of being a bad beekeeper, killing queens, all the rest of it.